thanks for that. It's a nice introduction. And, uh, and thank you all for being here, you know, the first day after Thanksgiving holiday. Um, as Daddy said, you know, I was in Southern California. I attended UCLA. And uh, it's very, very nice to be back to Southern California again. And uh, I was just talking to Daddy that, you know, um, there are some, some people talking about, you know, Irvine being boring, but, you know, you only know the nice thing about Southern California after you get out of here, as I did. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to talk about multi-level latent class regression of stages of change for multiple health behaviors. Um, this is a work I have been start doing uh, when I'm collaborating with uh, Centers for American Indian Alaska Native House um, when I was in Colorado. And then, uh, you know, I keep moving on, uh, keep working on it when I move to um, Texas. So here's the outline of my talk. Um, the, after a brief introduction to introduce the motivational problem of um, this project, I will give a brief introduction of latent class analysis for those of you who are not familiar with this statistical method. And then I'm going to introduce the modeling and uh, uh, estimation for multi-level latent class analysis. And then I will present some simulation results as well as the real data application re uh, analysis results. And I'll conclude with some discussion points. So just a brief introduction to, um, to give you the concepts of stage of change model and uh, um, some uh, concepts of multi multiple behavior interventions. Um, proposed by Prokaska and his colleagues in the 1970s, the essential ideas of the stages of change model is um, states that behavior change does not happen in one step. People tend to progress through um, different stages on their way to successful change, as shown in the um, diagram on the, um, you know, on the, on the right panel. And uh, the stages of change model theory um, um, proposed that intervention should be tailored for participants who are at different stages. Um, this model has been applied to a broad range of um, behaviors, including smoking, weight loss, exercise, and eating habits. So more specifically, uh, the stages of change model theory proposed that um, the process of changing uh, for behavior usually has five different stages. So the first stage is so-called pre-contemplation stage um, at which the individuals are not intent to change in, uh, in the foreseeable future. And then the next stage is a contemplation stage um, at which the individuals acknowledge the problem, but they are uh, not prepared to change their behaviors at present yet. However, they are seriously thinking about changing in the, near f in the future. And then the individuals and the preparation stage mm -hmm. include those who are actively considering changing their behaviors in the immediate future and the individuals at the action stage have already made behavior change recently, but the changes are not well established yet. And the last stage is usually called the maintaining stage, uh, which include the people who have changed their behaviors for an extended period, and they are working to sustain the change currently. So nowadays, um, effective, life, effective lifestyle interventions to prevent chronic diseases usually target on multiple health behaviors simultaneously. And if we want to look at the stages of change for multiple health behaviors, then it actually results in many different response patterns, just as shown, um, you know, illustrated by this um, graph. So, um, so for, um, in order to um, tailor the intervention for each stages of change pattern, usually um, it requires individualized intervention regimen. That is probably why most previous studies that apply the stages of change model to multiple behaviors simultaneously often relied on computer-aided programs to facilitate tailoring the intervention for each participant. However, many behavioral intervention strategies are more cost-effective if implemented in a group setting. 
Furthermore, um, it has been shown that um, the emotional support and as well as experience sharing um, during a group intervention session has been very important for the success uh, for successful behavior change. Um, yet, uh, if we um, we want to, ta it's very it's not very easy to tailor the intervention um, in a group intervention setting, though. So you know, if you want to individualize intervention strategy, it's not very easy to do that in a group intervention session. Um, therefore, if we can identify a few uh, subgroups among the participants based on their stage of, stages of change for multiple behaviors, it may help design the intervention tailored for a few classes. In other words, the, um, the advantages of the stages of change model and the multiple health, be uh, and the, uh, multiple health be group intervention may be combined. So um, in order to um, find a few late, uh, subgroups among the stage of change for multiple behaviors, um, I'm going to introduce a statistical method, the so-called latent class analysis. <coughs> the latent class analysis, it's a statistical method that has been used to identify latent subgroups through a set of observed multivariate categorical indicators. It provides a parsimonious and intuitively meaningful summary of cell frequencies in a high dimensional contingency table. So if we're going back to the uh, stage of change for multiple behavior problem, basically uh, latent class analysis could be an ideal way to um, identify a few subgroups um, and reduce the dimension of the high contingency tables. Um, if, if you are familiar with factor analysis, actually latent class analysis, it's analogous to factor analysis for continuous, um, for continuous observed variables. So it can be used to parse out um, measurement errors for, in some cases. This statistical method has become popular in many different research areas. So I'll just give you a few uh, examples. So in psychology, sometimes if you measure a uh, uh, individual um, for multiple depression symptoms. These symptoms could be categorical, either binary or se with several categories. Then latent class analysis can be used to categorize um, people into different um, depression categories um, based on their uh, reports to different symptoms. And also um, in behavioral science, people have been, researchers have used this method to group drinkers based on their drinking behaviors. And lastly, in survey methodologies, it has been used <laughs> um, to identify some flawed survey questions. So those are all very interesting uh, applications of latent class analysis. So before I uh, move to an example of latent class analysis, um, I want to introduce some key concepts of this method. Um, first of all, what are, what are the latent classes mean? They are actually the categories of the latent categorical variable that divide the population into mutually exclusive and exhaustive, exhaustive subgroups. So sometimes we call them latent subgroups, sometimes we call them as latent classes. And the, um, the most, one of the most important assumptions of the latent class analysis is a conditional independence assumption which means that, uh, which assumes that um, conditional on, on a particular latent class, then the observed indicators are independent of each other. And uh, class membership probabilities, which I will denote them by gamma c, are the percentages of observations belonging to each latent classes. If, so for example, if there are three latent classes, then the latent class analysis will report three class membership probabilities estimates, one for each class, and the three estimates will add up to 100%. And another terminology is so-called conditional item response probabilities, and I will denote them by rho, mk, given c, so um, the um, given c means you know, it's a conditional probability. Those are the probabilities of each response <laughs> for every indicator conditional on latent class membership. 
So for example, if we know an individual came from um, you know, the first latent class, then uh, what's the probability of the, this individual will um, choose option one for the first um, indicator? And uh, from, for, from latent class analysis, um, we will be able to get estimates for their posterior probabilities, denoted by as you know, PC um, given Y, which are the probabilities of uh, individuals being classified in a given class based on the individual's observed responses for the multiple indicators. And each case will have, so basically if a latent class analysis give, has uh, three latent classes, then uh, each individual will have three different pro posterior probabilities, indicating that this case is um, the probability of each case being classified into class one, two, or three. So after all the boring terminologies, um, <laughs> I hope I'll give you, I'll make some sense for you by uh, using this graph. <clears throat> so this is an illustrating example of latent class analysis applied to multiple lifestyle behaviors. And in this study, the, the investigators measure, measured five binary variables, and each of them meaning whether the participant adhered to the norm for that particular um, behavior. So, so like the first behavior, um, if a participant adhered to the norm of physical activity, then this participant will report one for that variable, and otherwise he will report zero, okay? And similarly, you know, for the vegetable variable, uh, it's a binary variable again, um, you know, the participant will report a one, which means yes, if adhere to norm for eating vegetable, and otherwise it, um, this person will report a zero for that variable. So basically, um, in here, in this study, the observed variables are five binary variables, and if you, um, if you put them together as a contingency table, you basically will get two to the five um, different response patterns, right? Because you know, each one will have two choices. So that means you will have you know, 32 possibilities in terms of their response pat different response pattern. And uh, that is a lot uh, when we want to use those, when we want to analyze all five variables together and uh, if we want to use them either as a, you know, a predictor variable or an outcome variable. So the investigators of this study, they applied the latent class analysis, and they found that there are in total uh, three latent classes, you know, among out of the 32 possible response patterns. And the first response, um, and in this graph, it actually plots the conditional item response probabilities um, for each uh, indicator, conditional on each latent class. So basically, for example, in here, it means that the conditional response probability for the first latent class is about um, 0.82 um, to endorse the, you know, the norm, to be adhering to the norm for fatal activity. And then similarly, you know, another example, so um, among the second latent class, um, the, the conditional probability for the um, individuals belonging to this class actually had relatively low probability to be adhering to the norm for the, um, for the vegetable eating, okay? And, uh, and then if you look at the first latent class, you will find that um, it has relatively high conditional um, response probability for almost all five behaviors, okay? So all of them are about, uh, around um, 0.8. So um, that means the participants belonging to this latent class, they actually have relatively healthy behaviors for all the five dimensions the, um, this, the investigator measured. <laughs> so that's why this class was called the healthy class, okay? By the, the investigators called them as the healthy class. And then let's look at the third class. So the third class is almost the opposite of the first class. So the conditional probability of this class actually are pretty low for almost all the five behaviors, right? So, they, so basically the individuals in this class, 
they had very low probability to adhere to the norm for all five behaviors. And we call this class as a healthy class. And then there's another class. They actually had relatively high conditional probability for the uh, fit activity, alcohol, and smoking. But then they had very low um, probability for adhering to the norm for the vegetable eating and, fr and fruit eating. So the authors of this article call them as the uh, poor nutrition class. Okay? So basically, this example shows you that you know, what a conditional response probability means. Okay? And also, um, the latent classes are actually the three lines showing, shows here. Um, and, and it shows that basically, you know, when you have multiple categorical indicators and when you, face, when you are facing a high, high dimensional contingency table, you can use latent class analysis to effectively reduce the dimension of the data into actually three latent classes, which can be easily used for future data analysis. All right. So, um, just want to uh, give you the model specification of these of latent class analysis using. Um, so, if we assume there are C latent classes based on M observed categorical items. And if we let yi equals uh, be an observed vector for the i individual, um, and if we assume that the latent class ci, so if we assume the latent class ci was observed, then the joint probability of yi, the observed response pattern, and ci, so in here yi are like you know the um, the indicators for all the five um, physical activities as I show in the previous example. So it could be you know one 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 zero or one zero one one one. It depends on you know how many uh, individuals adhere to the norm for each of the um, lifestyle behavior. And then CI, if we assume it is observed, is actually not observed, right? Because we call them C, uh, call them latent class. But um, the first step is that we assume it is observed. Then the probability of observing YI given CI equals to little c. It's just a cross product of the conditional uh, item response probabilities times the probability of the uh, latent class, okay, gamma c. So, um, so this is actually, um, if you are familiar with categorical data analysis, this is a pretty typical um, thing um, formula to calculate the probabilities of observing your response, okay. Um, and then, because we don't know gamma c, okay, we don't know the latent class analysis, so we do not directly observe the latent class analysis membership ci. Um, that is why you know the marginal probability of the observed item responses pattern for each particular response pattern for each individual, it equals to the summation for each potential latent classes. Um, times the class latent class membership, and then times the you know cross product of the conditional item response probabilities. <laughs> so um, the parameters in this um, in the in the latent class analysis are usually estimated by maximum likelihood using the uh, EM algorithm, and uh, the EM algorithm stands for expectation maximization algorithm, but if you don't know it, I guess I explain it, it <clears throat> doesn't make too much difference. Um, but the reason we use EM algorithm is that we actually treat the data on the latent class membership C as, as missing data, okay? <clears throat> so, <move forward. laughs> So the model estimation, the standard arrows are actually are not a byproduct of the EM algorithm. So um, we can use the first derivative of the likelihood function. And uh, <clears throat> however, it could yield standard arrows of zero for parameter estimates on the boundary. So um, another way is to take the inverse of the Hessian matrix. <laughs> um, but the standard arrows cannot be obtained if one or more of the parameters are estimated on the boundary either. So there's a technical difficulty for the um, for getting for estimate the standard arrows for latent class analysis. <clears throat> and then there are some um, 
people um, propose robust standard errors using sandwich type of estimators, which relies, rely on both cross product matrices and the Hazy matrix. And uh, there's also uh, people have proposed some basing approaches. So if we can use a mild smoothing prior or using data augmentation algorithm, then um, the, the problem with estimating standard errors could be alleviated sometimes. And uh, for latent class analysis, one of the major um, steps, the first step is to determine how many latent classes there are. Um, because we don't know, you know, for beforehand, you know, if there are two latent classes, three latent classes, or five latent classes. And there are different um, model selection criteria have been proposed, including the information criteria such as AIC and BIC. And all use some likelihood based, um, likelihood ratio based statistics such as G square and entropy based measures. And another principle is to um, avoid solutions with low class, um, class counts. And also um, parsimony and the model interpretation has been very important considerations for this type of, um, for select the number of latent classes. And then we can use Bayes theorem to compute the posterior probabilities. And individuals may be assigned to the class in which they have the highest posterior probability of membership and then use for future analysis such ANOVA. Um, latent class analysis has been extended to incorporate the effects of different covariates, so we call those as latent class regression. Um, basically, the, the way to incorporate the um, covariates into the, um, into the latent class analysis is through the function of gamma c. So now the latent class membership, uh, membership probabilities, gamma c, becomes a function of your covariates xi, okay? And uh, you can also, uh, you can <laughs> easily write the rates of class membership um, related to the covariates using a multinomial logistic regression. So it's like gamma C given xi, um, the probability of ci equals c given the um, predictor is, uh, you know, linked through a logistic function. And, uh, you know, this is very similar to, uh, you know, traditional multinomial logistic regression, except that the latent class membership is not directly observed, so that it is latent. All right, so um, I have introduced, the, you know, the so-called traditional simple latent class analysis so far. But remember the one of the most important assumption of latent class analysis is the conditional independence assumption which may not be met in many situations. So for example, if you have data collected from a multi-site study, then the data are naturally clustered. And in that case, you cannot really assume the data, you know, independent, uh, independent, uh, are independent of each other, even your conditional on each latent class. So um, multi-level latent class analysis has been proposed um, by different um, investigators. Um, so like Vermont have presented a framework for estimating multi-level latent class and latent regression models. And, uh, um, and then um, Milton and his um, you know, uh, colleagues have discussed how to fit general multi-level mixture models, including multi-level latent class analysis. And then recently, Dee and uh, um, his um, advisor proposed a multi-level latent class model in which class-specific um, membership probabilities came from a Dirichlet distribution. And uh, Bayesian methods have also been um, proposed recently. The applications of multi-level level latent class analysis in different research areas is still rare, though. So here's the model of a multi-level latent class analysis. Uh, it actually, if you are familiar with um, multi-level logistic regression, this is, again, looks very, um, you know, probably very familiar to you. Um, it basically, um, it, you just link the class membership probabilities to the, um, to the covariates at different levels, level one and level two, through a random effects logistic regression. Um, and if C is greater than two, then a two-level multi multinomial logistic regression can be used with C minus one random intercepts specified. 
So it's essentially the same as the traditional random effects logistic or multinomial logistic regression, except that the categorical outcome is not, not directly observed. It, may, it actually could involve high dimensional integral, which can be evaluated by different numerical integration methods. And then the interclass correlation um, as is defined as a proportion of variance of random effects out of the total variance, which is um, defined by this formula. And then the arrows can be estimated by computing the observed information matrix or standard sandwich estimator. So, <laughs> so far, the, there are three different softwares that can be used to feed multi-level uh, latent class regression, including M plus seven and latent gold, as well as SAS proc LCA. And however, in SAS proc LCA, it actually only uses so-called pseudo maximum likelihood and sandwich type of standard arrows that um, it's appropriate for complex survey data. Oops. Um, so it's not exactly the same as the model that I presented previously. So just want to show you some, um, so far, um, different people have proposed different um, methods for, to model multi-level latent class analysis, but, but none of them have shown a sort of simulation results to show the impact of, you know, if you don't use multi-level latent class analysis, what kind of bias or, um, you know, uh, in terms of parameter estimates and standard errors you will get. And so that's why I performed some simulation studies to show um, whether it is important, how important it is, or why it, it, imp it is important to model the multi-level structure of your data. So in the, situ in the simulations, I simulated either 300 or 30 clusters and then among those with, among the data sets with 300 clusters, I assume there's, uh, um, there are 10 subjects in each of the clusters. And then among the 30 clusters, I assume there are uh, 100 subjects per cluster. And I assume there are uh, different interclass correlations range from small, um, point o, as small as 0.05 and up to 0.25. And I assume there are two latent classes, three observed categorical variable items. The reason I assume there are three categorical items is because, um, you know, for the stages of change um, example, I actually have three different behaviors. So that's why I assume there are three different categorical items. And for each of them, there are five categories. It's also because, you know, for, the, for each of the stages of change variable, there are five categories from pre-contemplation up to maintenance. And then uh, I assume there's one continuous level one covariate for standard normal uh, distribution with regression parameter beta one equals minus 0.5. And assume there's one dichotomous level two covariate with regression coefficient alpha one equals minus 0.05, minus 0.5. So a thousand data sets were simulated for each scenario. So here are the um, simulation results. Um, basically, you can see that um, uh, when we have 30 clusters with 100 cl uh, individuals in each cluster, the relative bias <laughs> um, of the parameter estimates for both level one and level two covariates increase with the uh, uh, increase of the interclass correlation, okay? And then, however, if we use the multi-level latent class analysis, then the bias were, you know, relatively minimal. And then, um, similarly, when we look at the, um, you know, the coverage rate of the 95% confidence interval, and you can see that <laughs> if we use simple latent class analysis, um, if when the uh, interclass correlation is relatively small, then you don't have much, uh, the coverage probability is still, <laughs> excuse me, it's still pretty good for the level one covariates, but it's already pretty poor for the level two covariates. And then when your interclass correlation increases to 0.1 or 0.25, then even for the level one covariates, you know, the, um, the coverage probability was not very good. So. But um, on the other hand, the multi-level latent class analysis shows, um, you know, relatively good uh, coverage probabilities that's near 95 as it's supposed to be um, 
as shown in here. And we observe similar um, you know, ob uh, observations for the other um, scenario when we have 300 clusters and 10 subjects in each cluster. So again, the simple latent class analysis gives bias, when, especially when the intercluster cluster correlation are large. And uh, um, the multi-level latent class analysis don't have as much bias. And the coverage probability has similar performance. So basically, the simulation shows that, you know, um, if as long as you have a level two covariates in your latent class analysis model, it is very important to um, use the appropriate analysis method to uh, investigate the relationship of latent class membership and your uh, covariance effects. Okay. All right. So um, now I'm going to show you some real data application results. Um, the, the data came from the so-called Special Diabetes Program for Indians, Diabetes Prevention Program. It is a translational project um, that was founded by Congress in um, 2002 in recognition of the huge diabetes disparities that American Indian and Alaska Native are experiencing. So um, the, basically, the Congress directed the Indian Health Service to um, implement some evidence-based intervention programs to prevent diabetes and cardiovascular disease um, among American Indian and Alaska Native communities um, in the real world settings. The project starts in September 2004. So um, the, the diabetes program is one of the two arms of the demonstration projects funded by Congress. And uh, the, it starts in September 2004 which, uh, and it focused on the primary prevention of diabetes by implementing the, um, you know, the diabetes prevention program lifestyle curriculum in, among individuals at risk for diabetes. The eligibility criteria is basically American Indian and Alaska Native adults with pre-diabetes. Um, so 36 grantee sites from diverse American Indian and Alaska Native communities all over the country participated in this project and baseline data collection finished in August 2009. About 3,000 participants responded to the baseline questionnaire. So this is just a map of the uh, size of, of the SDPIDP program. Um, so you, know, you can see that there are 36 sites all over the country. The red ones are all the diabetes prevention projects are the grantee sites. And then the yellow ones are actually the other arm of this um, program. It's a cardiovascular disease prevention program. And uh, the, the cooling center is located in Denver, Colorado. So just a quick preview of the design of this um, pro, uh, SDPIDP. It's actually a fairly simple design um, because we are using a proven intervention um, strategy. Um, that has been, you know, proved very highly effective in randomized clinical trials previously. So we did not have a control group. So this is a one-arm intervention. All the participants, they, you know, after recruitment, um, they went through a baseline assessment, and then all of them started a lifestyle intervention as well as, as some community-based activities. And then we measured them um, at four to six months right after the intensive phase of the intervention. So basically after the um, the completion of all the 16 classes um, of the curriculum, and then we measure them annually. So in terms of the measurements I'm going to use for this particular study, um, the, we measured uh, for each individual their stages of change for three different behaviors, including um, uh, regular exercise, uh, healthy diet, and weight loss. And for, so each in, in the, uh, individual participant responded to three questions that will classify them into one of the stages of change, you know, running from pre-contemplation up to maintenance. So it worth noting that uh, we didn't really measure a preparation stage for the weight loss uh, indicator. So, um, so for that var variables, we only have four categories instead of five categories. And then uh, the, the individual level characteristics I'm using in this study, including social demographics, and the site characteristics, including uh, rural sites versus urban sites, and some organizational types like IHS versus tribal programs. 
Sorry, can you say yeah. again why you didn't do preparation for weight loss? Yeah, that's the instrument we selected to use. It didn't it have didn't the preparation have that, so stage. Yeah, exactly. But that's a good question. Actually, you, that question may come up later yeah. as well. Um, so, um, so here's uh, the model selection criteria um, for when I run simple latent class analysis. And uh, if you comp look at their, um, you know, I AIC, BIC, and G square, you will find class number, you know, three classes give you the lowest BIC and relatively low AIC. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there are some other um, criteria we use that is not showing here, also indicate that three classes it's a, um, gives you the best fit for your data. It also gives you the, you know, the, the best in terms of interpretation ability. So, so basically, if you plot the um, fit statistics, you will see that the um, three classes and four classes are possibilities, and three classes are more parsimonious and easier to interpret. So we chose to, um, to conclude with three latent classes. And then the first class is the, um, in the first class, basically it has relative, re relatively high conditional response probabilities <laughs> for both um, the diet and exercise um, uh, that, uh, you know, responds to the contemplation stage. And also for the, even for the weight loss, um, it also has relatively high probability to be classified in the contemplation stage. So that's why uh, we call this latent class as the contemplation class. And then for the preparation, for the next class, um, if you look at the first two um, behaviors, you know, they, they have very high conditional response probabilities for the preparation stage for both of these behaviors. And then for the third behavior, the weight loss, you will find that it actually has zero probability for the preparation stage. And that is because we didn't measure that stage, okay? <laughs> and then you, you also find that for the weight loss, it has very high probabilities for both the contemplation and the action stage, so the adjacent stage for the preparation stage. So that's why we call this class as a preparation class. And then the last class, um, the individuals have re relatively high item response probabilities for both the action and maintenance stages. So we call this class for all three behaviors. So we call this class as, uh, um, you know, the action maintenance class. <laughs> and then we just want to see whether our latent class membership makes sense by looking at the relationship of, our, of the latent class membership and the behavioral indicators. And as shown here that the wrap up actually are measures of physical activities for aerobic and strength and flexibility. And then the healthy diet score, a healthy diet score, and BMI, we found that those who were at action and maintenance stage had, uh, you know, uh, most of the physical activity level, the highest physical activity level. And, uh, the, you know, they eat most of the healthy diet score. Their healthy diet score is the highest and had the lowest healthy diet score and also had the lowest BMI. So this, um, you know, conforms to our expectation that those who are in action and maintaining stage um, had the health, um, healthiest behaviors. And then when we look at the latent class membership relationship and uh, with some psychosocial factors, we found that all similarly, you know, those who are at action and maintaining stage had the highest perceived health and coping skill as well as the highest family support, and also the, you know, the, um, the physical and the mental health-related uh, health quality of life. So for, um, this also confirms that, um, you know, the three latent classes, um, you know, works as uh, we expected. And now, since, you know, again... Um, Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. So the latent classes that you're using are, are derived variables, and so are we taking into account the uncertainty in the class assignment? Yes, um, actually in these numbers uh, are not because I was assigning each cases based on their highest posterior probability, but then in this one, let me see, the LCA regression, 
at the p-value when we did incorporate the uncertainties of the latent class membership. And uh, um, you know, we did latent likelihood ratio test to test the significance of so the. How is it incorporating the uncertainty then through a prior on the classes, or is it? It's it's through the. Um, no, it's actually through the EM algorithm. So basically, you assume the latent class membership are missing. So when you feed the probabilities, uh, when you feed the models, you estimate the prob probabilities based on that way. So you're doing it jointly. If you were going yeah. to take the latent class thing, though, and model it as a derived variable for something else outside of that framework. Yeah, you can, you, can you can do it that way. That's an easier way. But the, the better way, you know, uh, it has been shown that if you take the uncertainty into consideration, it actually gives you, um, you know, more unbiased estimate for the association between the covariates and the latent class membership. Yeah. And it has been shown that, and that's why <laughs> methods has been developed, like latent class analysis regression has been already developed. And then um, there's another um, method development uh, trying to use the latent class membership as, um, you know, the covariates of a latent, of a regression. So basically treating those um, you know, so use the latent class membership to predict some distal outcomes. So that is under development as well. So just for easier presentation, I showed you these numbers from the ANOVA analysis, but the p-values confirm the results. All right, so uh, remember our data is, uh, you know, SDPI, DP, it's a multi-site study. So uh, it's naturally clustered because the participants coming from the same site probably, you know, may have some different characteristics at, um, compared to the other clusters. So there's an in, uh, inherent heterogeneity. Um, that's why I started to look at multi-level latent class model um, to see if that fits our data better. And uh, um, these are the model selections I feed, and uh, uh, you can see that the the two, the model is two random intercepts that are per perfect correlated has the best fit uh, statistics in terms of BIC. And uh, uh, also when we have four different latent classes, you know, when there are three in random intercepts, <laughs> the model has very hard uh, time to converge because we have very high dimensional integration problem. And uh, um, after we fit in the multi-level latent class analysis, we find that actually the interclass correlation are not very huge which is quite typical for multi-level, multi-site studies. Um, you know, multi-center clinical trials usually find an interclass correlation around 0.05. So again, here are the three latent classes, um, the conditional probabilities for three latent classes. They are essentially the same as what we got using the simple latent class analysis. And then here are the results of the latent class regression. Um, for individual level, so you can see that I showed you, I presented the, both the, uh, the results from simple um, latent class analysis and then from multi-level latent class analysis. You can see that for the individual level characteristics, the parameter estimates and standard error estimates are, re are fairly similar, you know, not changed so much. But then for the site level characteristics, such as rural versus urban, then the parameter estimates was changed quite a bit and plus, the, you know, the standard errors, which was changed substantially as well, leading to uh, quite different conclusions. All right, so just some discussion. Um, stages, stages of change for multiple health behaviors may be summarized by a latent cl three class model. And class specific interventions may be designed to deliver lifestyle intervention more effectively and efficiently. Latent class analysis allow us to check the validity of the original stages of change measurements. So for example, the algorithm for assessing readiness to change for losing weight might be improved if we add a preparation stage. Else, uh, latent class analysis is an effective way for also for data reduction. And uh, so once after applying that, the analysis of multiple stages of change variables either use as outcomes or as covariates can be significantly reduced and simplified and streamlined. 
Um, the conditional independence assumption of traditional latent class analysis may not be met in different scenarios such as multi-site studies. <laughs> and the multi-level latent class analysis allows us to investigate latent class structure using data with clustered data structure without assuming conditional independence. And ignoring the interclass correlation of observations from the same cluster may lead to inaccurate estimation of the model variances and the effects of the covariates, especially for level two covariates. So here are just some future directions. So we can, you know, we plan to extend the simulation study to more complicated situations. And we also plan to compare the results of different estimation methods, um, you know, such as the Bayesian estimation using MCMC method. And also latent class analysis with distal outcomes can be used to analyze the relationship of latent class membership with, uh, with intervention outcomes. So here are just some limitations of my, um, of the study due to time limit, I'll skip that. And I would like to thank all my collaborators from the Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health at UC University of Colorado, Denver, and uh, um, also um, our funding agency, including Indian Health Service and uh, American Diabetes Association, which you know, enable me to have time to work on the multi-level nature of the data. And as well as all the um, IHS tribe and urban Indian health programs and the participants who involved in this, uh, in SDPIDP. And here are just some references. And uh, finally, I would like to thank you all for your attention and time. And any questions? We have time for, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question about the, uh, the standard errors. Mm -hmm. well, when I think of um, clustered observations or dependent observations within a cluster, I think of controlling for that as um, and it's essentially leading to larger standard errors than if you didn't control for clustering. Yeah, for level the two. The information mm -hmm. for each individual isn't as great given that there, there's dependence. Right, in it. right, right. But when I looked at your <laughs> estimates, it looked like the standard errors actually got smaller. Yeah, that's that, a good so question, that but kind of but I think your understanding for the um, standard errors are actually mainly for level two covariates. It's not necessarily true for level one covariates. Um, did you, uh, are you referring to this yeah. slide? Yeah, so I see this, right. And so I'm looking at the site level character, the last um, row. Because it seems that your method, which is a better correction method, is actually making uh, the The last row small. actually, it increased the standard error estimates for the site level characteristics. Is that, if I'm, but um, you may observe some um, different directions for the individual level characteristics, and that is possible for level one covariates. So, right, so the comparison isn't, so your model isn't AN versus C, it's actually a multi-level versus the single level standard error? Um, well, yeah, standard error this, this is a single level standard error, <laughs> so this panel. And then these are the standard arrows coming from the multi-level latent class that analysis. And the one that's better than the previous one is which standard error? Um, what do you mean? Uh, are you I talking about? I, I, I'm comparing <laughs> the 0.18 to 0.04, but I shouldn't be doing that, right? So what, what should I be doing? Oh, about? yeah. <laughs> this is actually the standard arrows for comparing preparation um, class to the oh, contemplation okay. class. And then this is action class to the contemplation class. So both of these are from single level okay, so latent class analysis. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in, you would expect, I mean, that's the correct direction. So it depends on whether the covariate is varying within the cluster or varying across the cluster, whether you expect it to go down depending on the correlation within the cluster. So right. it can go down if it's varying across the Yeah, for level one, it could go, go down. Simulation results. Uh, I found that you know the uh, single level method seeing that the direction of bias is negative, and for multi level the direction of bias is positive. So, do you have an explanation for that? Um, let me move to this um, slide, and then 
Can you repeat your question? Sure. So if you look at the simulation for the right, yeah. if you look at the simple LCA, mm -hmm. so using that uh, the bias, um, the bias is negative. Most of them are, are <coughs> oh, negative. Oh yeah. Right? And for the model level, most of them are positive. Do you have an explanation for that? Mm, that's a good question. Um, no, I don't. I just I I really got this directly from the simulations. It could be because I assume the relationship between each of the covariates and the latent class membership were negative. So I don't know whether that has anything to do with that. Yeah. It's a good observation. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. We usually have a